Okay, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. Last time we read about God's blessings when Israel reached the land of Canaan. Look back, uh, look at uh, verse 22. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sihon, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan, so forth. But then their sins against the Lord later on. Verse 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations, and God's eventual judgment on them. Look at verse 27. Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies, who vexed them, and in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou hurtest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. And I think I mentioned last time, the word savior has nothing to do with spiritual salvation. It means deliverers, to deliver them out of the, save them from the uh, plight of their enemies in, in invading uh, nations and peoples. But let's continue reading tonight verses 28 through 31. <clears throat> but after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, Thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies, and testifiest against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they doubt proudly, and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, parentheses, which if, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew uh, the shoulder, and hardened their neck, and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testifiest against, testifiest against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. <clears throat> Much of this is going to be have to be a future in its um, fulfillment. Um, or its application, not just limited to the time of Nehemiah writing it. Think of the Jewish people that uh, are scattered throughout the world before 1948, and the modern state of Israel was made official. Um, and their future troubles under an antichrist, and the whole world following him and uh, uh, being the enemies of the nation of Israel, the surviving Jews. The entire world will be against them. And so this wasn't limited only to fulfillment in Nehemiah's time. Um, in verse 29, we're reminded of the difference in salvation under the law, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and salvation under the grace of Jesus Christ not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Paul, Paul writes in Titus 3, 5. Uh, Nehemiah's words are from Moses. Go back, if you will, to Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. And notice one verse there. That's verse 5. Leviticus 18, verse 5. <clears throat> he shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Um, Nehemiah quoting it almost verbatim. Uh, Paul refers to it uh, as the plan of salvation under the law. Go forward, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, notice there, verse 5. 
For Moses describeth the righteousness, which is, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But notice what he had just written in verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Thank the Lord for that. And then verses 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. Who shall ascend into heaven? That's what science, that's what uh, certain education, that's what NASA is trying to do. Let's try to expand our knowledge of the universe and the world around us, and maybe it'll help us solve the problems we have right here at home. Or who shall descend into the deep? That's what religion and uh, philosophy and psychology, psychology and psychiatry all attempt to do, to look within or call upon the wisdom of great men or women in the past and see if anything they say can solve the problems we have right now. Uh, verses 8 through 10, here in Romans 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, if someone uh, truly believes uh, in their heart that and they're willing to admit to God by their mouth or however it is there, some people, there's always someone that wants to raise the question, what about someone that's deaf or dumb and they're not unable to speak? I think God understands. Uh, this is a general statement. Uh, I would say probably 96, 97, 98 percent of the people in the world are not deaf. Uh, maybe 99 percent of the people in the world are not deaf or mute. And so you get the point. If you're able to express that your knowledge of guilt, your knowledge of sin before God, that counts. So, but salvation is a very simple matter. That is faith in the heart and the willingness to admit that you're a sinner and need a savior. That gets the job done. It is not a complicated um, proposition of sacrifices and animals and keeping certain ceremonies on certain days and high holy days and feast days. Um, it's not a difficult pursuit at all. But in the time of Nehemiah, under the law of Moses, uh, it was difficult, a difficult system to live up to. And even then, uh, someone that maintained that standard of righteousness up to, the, up to their death, it still only got them as far as Abraham's bosom, the place of comfort. And that is made clear by the Lord Jesus in Luke 16, talking about Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, be, this all before Christ died on the cross of Calvary and was buried and rose again. Uh, Brother Randy Chapman made this point to me, and I hadn't thought of it the way he described it, but uh, he was right on. He said, so people that in the Old Testament, or people that will say in the Old Testament times, they were looking forward to the cross of Christ, and they were believing on Christ in anticipation of his future coming. And somehow they were saved that way. You'll hear ministers on the radio talk that way. It's idiotic. Uh, it has no effect, has no beneficial effect for you until it takes place. You can't look forward to something. Well, I, I can't wait to get my senior discount so I can go to Sizzler. I, I can't wait till I'm 55. Well, how old are you now, 30? Yeah, you've got a lot of ways to go. So it's going to be of no benefit to you until you reach the, <laughs> reach the target date, target age. Um, but if some of these radio call-in shows, you have someone call in regularly, every week, every two weeks, uh, Christian shows. And how did someone get saved in the Old Testament and the the ministers that aren't very sharp in their Bible say they were saved in the Old Testament the same way men are saved today, by faith, looking forward to the work of Christ and being faithful uh, to God as well as they could. 
God told them what they were supposed to do. It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Deuteronomy 6, 25. But uh, it only got them as far as Abraham's bosom, Randy was saying. And uh, then when Christ died and descended into the lower parts of the earth, the Bible says he led captivity captive. Those people who had gotten as far as Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort, waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ, uh, they're now fully saved by the grace of Christ and taken to heaven with him. And so, in a way, everyone is saved by looking back at the cross of Christ. Might have been only five minutes if someone had that if someone had died, uh, but uh, Christ might have only been dead five minutes before those people in in hell could look back now at his death and say that is now what I've been waiting for. So everyone is saved by looking back at the cross. You and I look back at it 2,000 years in hindsight. There may have been some who looked back, at, looked back at his death five minutes after it took place. But everyone is saved by looking back at the cross of Christ, not looking forward. By the way, and I, I wish I had thought to say this or write these notes down, the Book of Mormon, of course, it's all a work of fiction, but they tried to make it look like the Bible, and they'll have dates at the tops of the pages the uh, approximate year or century that these words were written by their so-called prophets. Of course, none of them ever existed. None of them ever lived. It's an entire work of fiction. But, but Joseph Smith, he played upon the ignorance of a lot of people, made it look almost King Jamesy, write it in paragraph form and throw a few these and thous and old English words in there to make it sound like Bible speak uh, in 1830 because all they had was the King James Bible. And by the way, that's all we need. <laughs> and, uh, but in the Old Testament section of the Book of Mormon, 400, 600 years before Christ, you'll find verses where people are talking about the coming of Jesus Christ and being saved by faith, believing on the, on the coming Christ, the Redeemer who will die for our sins and so forth. So, in essence, ministers who don't see the difference between Old Testament and New Testament approach to God are repeating what Mormons believe. They're teaching the same thing the Book of Mormon teaches. Um, and uh, verse 30, back in our text. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testifiest against them by thy spirit, in thy prophets, yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. That, um, while rejecting God's testimony through his prophets, the Jews of the nation of Israel actually killed some of God's prophets. And you don't need to turn, but Jeremiah 26, verse 24, reads, Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. And Christ asked, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not, Matthew 23, verse 37. So Christ brought to their uh, attention the fact that their own people, their ancestors, had uh, murdered and killed some of the prophets that were there speaking for the Lord God. Verse 31, uh, I'll read it again. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. That should be self-explanatory about the goodness of God, the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, God could have utterly destroyed the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, on many occasions, from 1500 BC up until 19, or rather, up until 2019 AD, for any number of reasons. And yet he's been patient and merciful and gracious and uh, long suffering. Go forward and look at one more verse in the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3.
probably even the last page of the Old Testament. Malachi 3. And notice there verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Do you know why the Jewish people have been able to survive and uh, know their identities, even if they don't have accuracies of uh, which tribe their family descended from. A lot of that was just destroyed when the Romans came in in 70 AD. But the reason these people have been able to survive and they know who they are, what they are, and who they descended from had nothing to do with any extra cleverness on their part. And uh, it has to do with the mercy and the grace of God, God protecting them. No country, no borders of their own for 1900 years, and uh, no army protecting them, no national flag to fly to unite them, no organized government to uh, keep society together for them. And uh, they were spread out from country to country, to Russia, uh, to the Far East, even as far as Japan, and uh, south end of Africa, European Isles, and as far as Latin America, South America, and the United States in time, and all around the world. And yet they still kept their identity, and they knew that they were aliens in, a, in an alien society. I was watching the, how many know that, the uh, Jewish comic, Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason, the Jewish comic. Yeah, some of you. But uh, he's got a real uh, pronounced uh, uh, Jewish uh, Philadelphia, Bronx, Brooklyn accent. He was once a rabbi and decided to go into stand-up comedy and uh, been much more successful as a comic. But I was watching something he, he was saying um, oh, it's probably an old clip 15, 20 years ago. He was saying Jews uh, around the world have learned when they're in, a, in an alien society that, that uh, if they, they work hard, they get more education than anyone else has, and they become needed in that society, then that society is less likely to persecute them. So that's why it's, very, uh, it's a matter of pride for a Jewish family to say, our son's a doctor. Because uh, once people need you, then they're not going to persecute you. At least that, he says, that's the, been the s social thinking of Jewish people all around the world. Well, God gave them, um, began to regather them into a nation, the modern state of Israel, back in 1948. And it's blossomed and become a modern miracle of you know, modern times that nation has. But... God made promises to Abraham and his descendants for a physical inheritance of a physical plot of land and the whole world by extension uh, over which Christ will rule as their king for a thousand years. And um, he still has in, in every intention to fulfill those promises. They haven't been fulfilled yet. So he has to keep the, the uh, seed, the remnant alive until the right time. Let me continue reading verses 32 through 38, the end of the chapter. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, uh, let not all the trouble seem little before thee, that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria, unto this day. Howbeit thou, thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turn they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof, 
and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion on our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. Most of this should explain itself as you read. It's a uh, what's called a penitential prayer on behalf of the entire nation. Um, the trouble, he mentions, since the time of the kings of Assyria actually began back in 2 Kings 17. You can read about their warfare, the invasion of the Syrian, ar Assyrian army, um, following a string of corrupt kings in, in the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, uh, listed in the two or three previous ch preceding chapters. Um, Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, verse 33 says. That's something every Christian has to um, admit to himself, that God is right and you are wrong. I am wrong. That what I think is good for me may not be good for me at all. God knows more about me than I know about me. And we, we don't give God credit for having our best interests at heart and looking out for us. And it's easy to say, it's tempting to say, yeah, but things God thinks are good for me are sometimes very, very painful. They bring me a lot of misery and uh, dissatisfaction and unhappiness, at least they seem to be, seem to. And yet he still knows more about you than you know about you. And uh, we have to think of him that way. Um, <clears throat> verse 34 of this text. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. We could probably expand that to neither have our mayors, our city council members, neither have our county supervisors, neither have our um, governors, our state attorneys general, uh, our U.S. presidents, our Congress members, our U.S. senators, <clears throat> neither have so many other officials um, throughout the country hearkened unto the things they ought to do and be uh, obedient to the things listed in the Word of God. The Bible tells us to um, submit um, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, Romans 13. And yet you read about the higher powers doing all kinds of things that uh, it's hard to reconcile yourself to as a Christian. And the things the lawmakers pass, the things they allow. <clears throat> you know, churches, churches, um, Church buildings, church property, they take up a pretty pretty good size piece of land in most neighborhoods. I don't know what our lot here is. Is it a half acre or more than that? Do you know? I'm not sure. But some churches take up a big swath of land in the neighborhood. And if that church, that religious organization, applies here in the United States and gets tax-exempt status from the IRS then uh, that means the county, the city, can't collect any sales tax revenue from them or property tax revenue from them. No federal income tax is going to be paid to on what contributions the church members give to the work of the church. And a lot of cities, I think, resent that. You know, if we knock down that church, we could put up a, a little grocery store, a few, a little strip mall, we could put up a whole couple of apartment buildings and get um, tax prop or uh, property tax revenue from uh, the people that would move into it. And I think cities, because uh, all politicians um, are good at squandering other people's money, um, <laughs> you wish you could get a hold of their checkbook and, and go crazy with it sometimes and get their credit cards and run them up to the limit and then give them their wallet back. Here you go. 
good luck paying all that back. But <clears throat> that's the world we live in. And um, so lawmakers, people in charge, people who have responsibility uh, and authority, I should say, over us, <clears throat> many times don't do and don't behave as they ought to uh, in an open society uh, with the idea of God watching in mind. Uh, founding fathers understood this, that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. They thought the uh, even the highest levels of government are ultimately going to be answerable to a, even higher authority on the day of judgment. But uh, they've long since forgotten that. And they need to be reproved. They need to be rebuked. It's funny I shouldn't say funny. I use that phrase too often. It's unfortunate, maybe that's a better word, that a politician can get elected to unlimited terms. Congressmen, or whether um, House of Representatives or U.S. Senate, they can get elected to unlimited terms. And they, and the, every time the suggestion of a term limits is proposed by citizens and citizens groups. People say these people get elected, then they stay there with a cushy job, getting uh, well paid, rubbing shoulders with heads of state, rubbing shoulders with celebrities on occasion, and thinking they're they're more important than they really are. Half of them are functional um, idiots. Yeah, they're they're not as bright as as they want you to think. And because they, you know, uh, I didn't mean to dwell on political subjects, but I'll get back to this in just a moment. A U.S., a brand new uh, representative of U.S. Congress starts off at $176,000 a year. That's their starting salary. Before they've ever done anything, that's their starting salary. And uh, if they get added to some special committee, I think they get an extra $10,000 a year for every committee they're on. So they all want to sit on all these committees because it means more money in their uh, own pockets. The average, what's the average wage the, the average citizen makes here in the U.S.? The median wage, when you factor in the highest paid and the lowest paid, it, it can't be anywhere near $176,000 a year. And so they've got these jobs, and every time it's suggested that that uh, we have term limits, you get elected maybe once, twice, and then that's it. You have to go back home and let someone else have a chance. They say, well, we don't want to allow that because what we want are politicians who have experience and know what to do. Yeah, but Ted Kennedy had a lot of experience, and it was nasty experience. He was an embarrassment. But uh, So you don't want people making their lifetime careers um, on the backs of the taxpayer. And yet they don't have a, very few of them have any moral fiber or conscience any longer. All right, moving on. Verse 37. Verse 37, And it yieldeth much increase the land unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle as their, at their Excuse me, at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. Um, we'll stop there tonight, but go forward to the book of John. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and verses 31 to 33. John 8, verses 31 to 33. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice right there, he equates the word truth with knowing his word. He said in John 17, verse 17, he prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. But, Verse 33, 
they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? They completely missed the point of his word. They also lied right to the face of their Messiah, saying we'd never, we were never in bondage to any man. We just read that they were. We just read that uh, at the time of the rebuilding of the temple, they had been under the dominion of enemy nations all around them, controlling their land, taking their crops, uh, taking their, their work of their farms, controlling their bodies, making servants out of all of them. And here they lied right to the Lord Jesus. And then what he says in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. That's the freedom Christ said he was coming to bring. Freedom from being the servant of sin. And uh, that comes from believing on him through his word. Believing on him through his word, which he said is the truth, uh, will bring to you freedom from the dominion of your sin. You know, when someone has no, they've done something wrong, and they don't sense there's any forgiveness for them, that guilty conscience can eat away at them like nothing else. It'll, it'll ruin their blood pressure. It'll ruin their, their health in, the, in a dozen different ways and uh, drive them mentally crazy. But once you know that God is willing to forgive and you trust that the Bible is telling you the truth, then you become free indeed. And that's what the Lord Jesus promised to those who believe on him and believe his word. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.